Um, so I will, since I'm assuming that you guys took a little bit of time and at least attempted these um, between class and now, I'll start working through these. So for starters, let's look at A. So we had cyclohexene. All right, reacting with heat. So reminder, we're trying to, we want to make sure that the orbitals at the end of the pi system can line up with each other. So we have three pi clouds here. So our pi clouds are gonna look something like this. Oops. That's, that's a really bad one. Remember, you can just draw them like they're stretched out figure eights. And if we're talking about using heat and not light, we're talking about the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital. And the HOMO, it's going to have, remember, we're always going to have one fewer nodes than the number of pi bonds. So if we have three pi bonds, our HOMO will have two nodes. And so it doesn't matter whether you start shading in the top or the bottom, but just every time you get to a node, switch which side is shaded versus not. So at the end of our pi system, we have orbitals that have their, their shaded section pointed the same way. So if we want to draw, draw this as our generic ring structure, that's that generic ring structure, that's all the rest of the pi bonds. So we could, you know, if you wanted to fill these in here for the sake of, I drew one extra in here, of showing what those are, that's the rest of the pi bonds that are there, as well as everything else that's attached. What we really care about though, is making sure that the pi orbitals at the end of the pi system can be pointed the same direction, could be lined up overlapping each other. So we don't really care about the rest of the pi system when it comes to figuring out which way this thing will rotate. So since we're using only heat, we're looking at the HOMO. Our two shaded sides of the orbital are going to be facing both upward or both downward, depending on how you drew it, doesn't make a difference. And then I didn't draw them in initially, but we probably wanna have the ethyl on both of these drawn in as well. All right, so now if we want to make the shade, either the shaded part or the unshaded part, doesn't matter which one you pick right now, because you'll get a symmetrical molecule, we need to make them rotate in opposite directions so that the two shaded orbitals can be overlapping each other. So one's got to rotate clockwise, the other one's got to rotate counterclockwise. So that is that con rotatory is the vocab word we use to describe that. Sorry, that's backwards, disrotatory. Because the, so they're always going to rotate towards each other. So you can't just say rotate inward or rotate outward. It's 
you have to think of them as rotating clockwise or counterclockwise from your perspective, which is what always gets, I always get hung up on. So disrotatory, because they're gonna rotate in opposite directions, clockwise and counterclockwise. So our final product here is gonna have both of the ethyls pointed the same direction. They're both going to be on the same side of the, as of the ring. So our final product here, this, the first cyclohexyl group isn't gonna really change other than the pi bonds are gonna move, right? So one of the pi bonds we draw as moving over here. So our new cyclo group is going to look like this. And our two ethyls wind up being on the same side of the molecule. And you could draw them up or downward. Doesn't make a difference, right? Because we get a symmetrical molecule either way. What matters is that they're both on the same side of the ring, not that they're up or down. And again, you don't need to draw all of this for the whole thing if you can start to visualize how the nodes work, you can, I still find it helpful to draw this section just to, so that you can visualize exactly what you're looking at. But again, you don't need to do that once you start to see how this works. Or if you have the table of the Woodward Hoffman rules right in front of you, you can just use those to say, okay, this situation is disrotatory, therefore, they're both going to rotate upward. All right, let's do the other ring closing ones first. You can get the hang of those, and then we'll we'll go back and look at the ring opening reactions. So let's look at C. C is also going to be um, the same system. It's still three pi bonds. We're using heat. So that means our, our homo and our lumo, or homo is going to be looking the same. except that we have an ethyl pointed the same direction to begin with, as opposed to both pointing outward, they're both pointed in the same direction. So if we want these two um, orbitals to overlap with each other, we're it's still going to be disrotatory, one clockwise, one counterclockwise. But because we started with the two ethyls pointed the same direction, if we do the disrotatory rotation, we wind up with the two ethyls pointed in opposite directions. So for C, we would still get a cyclohexyl group. We just wind up with the two ethyls that are left over, one pointed up and one pointed down.
right? So any of these with heat, we're looking at the HOMO. The HOMO is always going to have one fewer nodes than the number of pi bonds. And that allows us to set it up so that we can see what's going to overlap. So if we were looking at A for 1621, So is that it? Am I missing, there's what, methyl on each of these pointed in out, outward? So light tells us we're dealing with the LUMO. LUMO is gonna have the same number of nodes as pi bonds. So if we draw, draw all of our orbitals, three, four, five, six, three nodes, and it doesn't really matter where you put them, but if you're being trying to be as accurate as possible, you should make them symmetrical. And the best way to do that is like this. And again, it doesn't matter where you start shading, top or bottom, but every time you hit a node, you flip. So shade the top, hit a node, shade the bottom, shade the bottom, hit a node, shade the top, shade the top, hit a node, shade the bottom. So now our system, if we draw it in our simplified way, the two ends of the chain of the pi system, if we have the top shaded on the left, it would be the bottom on the right. And we started with our two methyls pointed outward. So if we want to, get these orbitals to overlap with the same phase, this is our con rotatory. Right, because they're both gonna be rotating clockwise or both rotating counterclockwise. And that is gonna put one of the methyls up one and the other methyl down. So our final product here is gonna look like that. Right, so the only thing, the only difference between these is that because it li has light shining on it as the catalyst, we go to the LUMO instead of the HOMO. If it's heat, you stick with the HOMO. So H and H, heat for HOMO, light for LUMO. C is another heat one. So HOMO, which means with three pi bonds, it's gonna look just like the ones up above.
except we have our methyls are both pointed the same direction now. So if we want the shaded part to overlap, it's going to be con it's going to be disrotatory. Said I struggle mixing those up because I always see it visually and it, they always look like they're rotating towards each other, right? Um, if you just think about it that way, you don't need to worry about the con rotatory versus disrotatory terms as much. Just make the orbital phases overlap. That's all you need to think about. All right, so in this case, when we rotate those, they're gonna wind up going in opposite directions. So our product would look like the cis product plus En. All right, so the ring opening reactions are the trickier, are the even trickier. These ones are confusing at first. The ring forming reactions are confusing at first, but once you understand the rules of how these sigma bonds are forming, they're pretty predictable. And they're, it's the same process for figuring it out every time. The ring opening reactions, we're trying to make the conjugated pi system bigger. So we're looking at what is the homo or the lumo of what we're trying to make when the ring opens. Because if we start from having those orbitals overlapped and we need to, the direction we're going to go from there depends on whether we want our phases to be opposite or the same. All right, so it depends on where it's headed. Is it trying to get to the, the homo that looks like this? Or is it trying to get to the LUMO that looks like that? And that's going to be based on the light and the heat. So we're trying, you all have to see what the product is going to look like before you know whether things are going to be cis or trans. All right, so that's the trickier part. So for B, I know we did this a little bit in class, but let's go back through it again. We have these two ethyls. And it was heat, correct? Okay. So that means that regardless of which way the ethyls are going to be facing, when it when the ring opens, it's going to look like this. We can draw in everything except where those ethyls are going to go. We know the ethyls are going to be attached. We just don't know whether they're going to be pointed the same direction or both pointed outward. So we want to look at the homo of two pi bonds. Our two pi bond system is going to look like four of our figure eights. And HOMO is one fewer node than pi bonds. So we only have one node here. So this is what we want the orbitals to look like at the end. If we're starting with them, like this with both of the ethyls upward. And we want to rotate them so that the shaded part and the unshaded part are pointed in opposite directions. We need the shaded part from one of them to go to, to rotate to the upward position. The shaded part from the other one has to rotate downward in order to make it look like the homo over here.
right? So if we start with them both upward and we want both of the ethyl groups upward and we rotate the shaded part upward, we get an ethyl pointed outward. And on the other side, we want the ethyl or the shaded part to go down. So we're gonna wind up with both ethyls pointing the same way. It's con-rotatory. Right, and so we're, our final product would look like that. Oh, sorry, they're ethyls, not methyls, but. All right, so you guys see how the, the difference when we're doing the ring opening is we're trying to get it to look like what the HOMO should look like, as opposed to starting from the HOMO and then overlapping the orb orbitals. We're starting from the overlapped orbitals and trying to make it look like the HOMO. Now, if we're trying to do the same thing with light, if we're looking at 21B, and it started with them, two methyls both pointed out towards us, right? Is that, is that correct? We're trying to make something that would look like this with the two methyls attached some way. So if we're talking about two pi bonds, and we've got light, so we're talking about the LUMO. So if we're talking about the LUMO, it's the same number of nodes as pi bonds. So two nodes. So now when we color these in, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Every time you hit a node, you switch. So we want it to, them to have the overlapping orbitals facing the same turning so that both phases are pointed up or both of the shaded sections are pointed up at the same time. So we're starting with them overlapping and we want both of the shaded sections to be go the same way. So that tells us Disrotatory, one clockwise, one counterclockwise. And so if if my index fingers are the methyls and my thumbs are the orbitals, they're starting overlapping and we want them to go like this. Right? They're rotating outward. So there's my very crude overlapping sigma bond there with the sit where the shaded section is where it's overlapping. We want it to look like the LUMO on the left when it's done. So we need both of those shaded sections that are right now are overlapping. They both need to be pointed up or they both need to be pointed down. But either way, they're going to be rotating outward, both of the methyls that were facing up are going to be facing outward in order to get those pi bonds the right direction.
or they're both going to be facing inward, but then we have a steric issue, right? As long as both of my thumbs are pointed the same direction at the end, we could rotate either direction, but if we rotate them downward, then we wind up with the two methyl groups running into each other is less than ideal. So our final product here would look like that or that. Probably more likely that they're gonna be facing in opposite directions just because of sterics. We'll say the using the stylus on a touch screen is has some advantages over a whiteboard. I'd never have to worry about the, the whiteboard markers stop working or picking a color that's not visible. Does make that easier, even if it's a headache in other ways, plus easier to clean it. All right. Yeah, Cody. Um, sorry, but I don't know if I was paying close enough attention. Did we do disrotatory for both of those ring opening reactions with heat and light? No, we did con rotatory the first one because when it was heat, they needed to end up facing, we needed the orbitals to end up facing opposite directions. So if we started with them like this, we use my same thing, my the alkyl groups for my index fingers. If we want the two shaded sections to be pointed opposite directions, we had to do con rotatory. I may have misspoken and used the wrong term. But for B, we wound up with something that looked like that i'm a little confused on the ring forming versus ring opening is with the three pi system with light we get the con rotatory and then the three pi system with heat we get the dis rotatory for a ring forming but if we have a if we're going to form a three pi system with a ring opening does that get reversed? Um, no, because we're still trying to make the same Pi system that we started with. So, so if heat if heat led to disrotatory, heat for the ring open reaction will also be disrotatory. So it doesn't matter if it's ring forming or ring opening, it has to do whether it's a two pi bond or a three pi bond system. Exactly. Okay. So if we, that's, that's not a bad idea. Let's, let's look at 20 a and I'll start from the product and let's say we use light. So let me draw the product. And we wound up with it being cis. So that was our product from, from 20A, right? If we expose that to light, for the ring opening reaction, we want it to look like the LUMO. So the LUMO is the same number of nodes as, as pi bonds. So 
if we fill it in. We want it to look like this. So the product needs to be lined up so that the shaded parts are pointed in opposite directions. So if we started with it, maybe a switch change in color might be helpful here. So if we started with it, overlapping and we want it to get to having the shaded sections in opposite directions. So if the one in the red on the left hand side needs to be pointed so that the shaded part is up, we, we're not, we're going to rotate in a con rotatory way. So that the shaded section from the red one goes up, the shaded section for the blue goes down. So we're doing that. So that means that we wind up with both of the methyls pointed the same direction, which is why a lot of, this is exactly why a lot of times they're drawn so that they're a little bit bigger. They don't look like true hexagons so that, so that when you draw them like this, they don't look like they're overlapping. Right, so if we they both rotate counterclockwise to make the the red shaded section go up and the blue shaded section go down, then both methyls will be pointed towards the left when that rotation is complete. So the con rotatory product is both of the methyls pointed towards the left the way I have it drawn here. So we end up with that and plus the rest of the molecule behind it. So we're just undoing what had been done before. Instead of starting from the homo and lumo and then rotating it to make it overlap, we're starting with it overlapped and making it look like the homo or the lumo. All right, so those are tricky. They take practice. We will continue to practice. And hey, you only have two more weeks of lecture. You only have three more OCHEM lectures this quarter. This is week 10. Next week is week 11 and then finals week. So with that in mind, um, I'm gonna start you guys working on your lab final um a week earlier so that we don't wind up with it overlapping as much with your with your final exam um and so the the uh what am i looking at uh canvas shell has the assignment is now visible for everybody um, so from, from home, go to assignments, or you can go to
Um, I will update the link. I did not update the link yet, but if you look at the to-do section and your to-do section should have significantly less than mine because I haven't been filling in fake assignments for myself, for my test student. Um, but in, under the to-do section on the right-hand side, you should see lab final. Uh, and your lab final has got a few, it's got a PDF of the assignment and it's also got a separate PDF that's just the stockroom um, inventory. And so essentially what you're going to be doing um, is going to be a synthesis problem. It's going to be a long synthesis problem, four or five steps for everybody. Um, and I want you to take into account as much synthesis, as much, as many practical application issues as possible. So for a lot of our reactions, I don't, in class, I don't get into the specifics of, um, oh, if we're doing ozonolysis, then you're going to expose it to ozone. And we just say, O3, and this is your product. We don't go into like, well, what does it look like in a lab to actually mix a gas reactant with a liquid reactant? You know, there's a, there are some practical issues there. How do you do that? It turns out in that case, what you actually do is you bubble the ozone into your reaction, into your liquid phase to try and keep it as well mixed as possible. Um, but those are the sort of considerations that I want you to take into account. Um, and I'm going to, I'm actually going to start at the end here and read you guys a disclaimer that I wrote um, that's specific to 2020 and 2021. Um, I get that you guys have not been in a lab with me. You have not actually put any glassware together. If, I'm, if we're lucky, you remember what most of the glassware is called, but I'm gonna call that a win at this point. Um, so most of your grade for this assignment is going to be on just planning what the steps are. Based on the reaction, on the product that I want you to make and the stock room, how can you design a synthesis pathway in as few steps as possible? And I think for all of them, the minimum is is four steps. Um, several of them, the minimum number of steps is five steps. So you shouldn't go a whole lot of steps more than that. But most of your grade is just going to be on, here's what I started with, here are the reaction sequences that I did to get to this final product. And then I want you to do some stoichiometry to figure out, okay, if I want 10 grams of product, how many grams of precursor do I need to start with? In other words, taking it into planning the actual reaction out, even if, if you don't have the, the experience to be able to say, you know, take a 250 milliliter round bottom flask and hook it up to a reflex condenser for 30 minutes. Like, okay, you guys haven't done any of that. So I get that that's gonna be really, hard to do for, for you guys in this situation. So you can get an 85% on this one without tackling any of the practical aspect at all by just designing your synthesis pathway and, and getting the right steps to get from a precursor to, um, to the, your assigned product. However, if you want an A, on this test, then you have to at least try to come up with a procedure. There's a lot of stuff in the procedures that I've had you guys look at. There's a lot of stuff online. There are a lot of resources for how would you plan it. And so if I was trying, if you were trying to plan this and you weren't sure what to do, but you knew what the reaction should be, like, okay, I know I need to, um, I know I'm gonna need to do a Grignard reaction for, to do this step. Well, Google Grignard reaction procedure, find a good base pre procedure, fill in your amounts and your reactants instead of theirs and make sure that you cite your source. 
um, and do try to write it in your own words. Don't just copy and paste it and, and you know, do a control F to, to find and replace stuff. Actually write it in your words, but you can start from other people's procedures. That's how science works, right? I'm not asking you to reinvent the wheel. Uh, I'm just trying to, I'm asking you to apply what's already out there to the synthesis that I'm giving you. All right, and do your best on that. Uh, there's some, when it comes to um, some of these steps, like I want you to try and plan out um, what sort of purifications you need to do. If you're making a product that's um, soluble in a polar solvent and you're in a polar solvent, you might need to do a liquid liquid extraction, use a separatory funnel to extract your product from the reaction mixture. If you make a solid product, you might, then you're probably gonna to wanna to do a recrystallization using the right solvent. And remember, this was a long time ago now, but recrystallizations, you wanna pick a solvent where your product is soluble, but not too soluble, where it will just barely dissolve, right? So, the procedure part of this is, okay, here's my reaction pathway. This particular step, I'm gonna do a, um, mix these two things together in, you know, weigh out 15 grams of precursor with five grams of sodium borohydride, and then let it react for 20 minutes and then do a recrystallization. And then I'm gonna take that product and I'm gonna react it with a Grignard reagent. And I'm going to let it react for this long. And then I'm going to do a liquid liquid extraction followed by a recrystallization. Right. So I know that I'm asking you to use your judgment on some of these things that you don't feel like you have very much judgment on yet. Um, and that part wouldn't change from last year, frequently, or frankly. Um, you know, last year's class also got really, really tripped up by this because. Well, how do I know what, what phase the product is? How do I know if I need to do a, a extraction versus a, a, um, a recrystallization? Well, the answer is you look it up. Look up what you can. Look up the name of the product that you're trying to make and see, oh, it's soluble in, in the solvent I'm using. Therefore, I need to do a liquid-liquid extraction. Or it's not soluble in the solvent I'm using. So I made a solid product and I just need to do a recrystallization. So it's going to be a lot of look things up on the internet, cite your sources, tell me how you got to those conclusions, but and do your best on that. And even if even if you really, really just sort of, um, what's the term I'm looking for? I'm blanking. If you really just sort of half-assed um, your procedure, well, a half-assed job gets half credit, but half credit still gets you an eight, you know, close to a ninety percent on that last on this overall, right? So plan out your steps, plan out the reactants and the stoichiometry, assume that every reaction will give you a 65% yield. Because we don't wanna assume 100% yield for any of these because most of these reactions are gonna be equilibrium reactions and you won't actually get 100% yield. So 65% yield is probably on the low end, but that's not a bad, way to be, we'd rather make more product than less. And as long as you get the right reaction steps and you do your stoichiometry and your, um, along the way, and then you can get an 85%. And then if you write, try to write out your procedure and do the best you can with it, I wanna be able to give everybody like 95 to 100% on this, right? That's my goal, it should be your goal too, unless you're, okay with your grade and you, you're fine taking an 85 percent that's fine too um i'm giving you that out because i know that this writing the procedure is daunting um here is your stockroom i give you some information about about the this this is i started this from our actual stock room. And then I added a couple of things to it that in a perfect world we would have in our stock room, but we can't for various reasons. Like we don't have lithium aluminum hydride in the stock room on campus because it doesn't last long enough and we would only use it two times a year anyway. And it's expensive. So we just, 
we would need to rebuy it every year for to do use it in two labs. So we just don't stock it. We don't put keep it in the stock room. Sodium borohydride, on the other hand, um, we do have in the stock room because it lasts longer. It's not as reactive. So we've got a whole bunch of different um, products or reactants here. The stuff that is a that is a source of carbon. I believe everything that has carbon in it, uh, for the most part. Um, is on the left-hand side. So these are gonna be the molecules that you could start from. And here are your reactants on the right-hand side. This is pretty much everything you would need for any of the reactions that we've covered in this class so far. Um, so with those tools, I'm not gonna tell you where to start. I'm just gonna tell you that each of you has your own project. Your job, should you choose to accept it, now you you have to accept it, you don't get that option. Um, your job is to make these compounds starting from the material above. All right, so any of them, it can take four, three to four or five steps. There might be, there might be a couple that only take three steps, but I think all, most of them take at least four steps. Um, if there's anything that you feel like is missing on your stockroom list, like, oh, I really want to do, I really think that a, you know, an epoxide formation is what I need to do here, but I don't have the right reagents for it. Well, maybe there's another way to do an epoxide formation, or maybe I forgot it. So don't be afraid to ask. Um, I think I have it pretty well set this year. Last year, I had to add stuff to it three or four different times um, because I had forgotten things. I think it's pretty good this at this point, but you never know. Um, but we even have you know, Lindler catalyst, hydrogen gas, all of the stuff that we've been using for free radical reactions. You've got n bromo succinamide for free radical reactions in the allylic position. Um, lots of different possibilities. You know what I think we're missing? I have to double check whether this is necessary or not. Um, no, there's bromobenzene. So if you're, if you're trying to do something with benzene, you're probably gonna have to start with the bromobenzene because that's your only source of phenyl rings, right? So you, you are somewhat limited. And that is something that as, is a result of, of our actual stock room. We don't keep benzene in the stock room because it's a pretty potent carcinogen that evaporates really easily. Um, so we, we try not to keep benzene, but bromobenzene has a much lower vapor pressure, doesn't evaporate so easily. It's still a carcinogen, but it's a lot less of a carcinogen. Um, so you can't, you're not gonna start from benzene, you're gonna start from bromobenzene. Which, and we also haven't done much with electrophilic reactions yet. Although I think our last chapter that we're gonna cover this quarter has some things with the, um, where we bring in benzene. So if you're doing something with benzene, um, stay tuned, but you can start planning out your, your synthesis pathway. All right, and again, I encourage you guys to work in groups, bounce ideas off each other. That said, it's not necessary. I'm not gonna put people in groups. Um, and if you are working in a group, you know, be a good, a good, uh, study, study buddy, and, uh, try to contribute as much as you benefit. Um, don't just show up, ask people for help and leave. You know, that's not very reasonable. Any questions about the assignment at this point? Adam? Yeah, so uh, I was curious, like you were talking about practicality and doing things in the uh, lab. And I think I might be uh, off a little bit, but I remember something like hydration takes a lot of heat and a lot of energy and it's like not that safe. Um, so it's more of like a industrial production. So is that something that we should consider? I, I know you said that one's like a carcinogen and stuff like that too. Well, so if it's on, if it's on this list, then you can use it. 
if it's not on this list, but you think you want to, like if you wanted to use, if you thought that using fluorine would be beneficial for some reason, um, and but fluorine's not on this list, then you can ask me about it. And I can, I'd say, well, just, you know, in a real world, yes, we'd like to do that. But practically speaking, anything, anything fluorine can do, bromine can do safely. Um, so I, if there's anything that you really do think that you're missing, let me know. And if you have an option based on what's on the stock room, you can try to pick the more safe, safe option, but it's not, uh, you could even make a note of it. Like this would be a different option, a different way to do it, but that's less safe or would give us not as strong of a yield or something like that would be, you know, that'd be a full credit sort of um, situation where you're trying to, or explaining why you went a specific route. Did that answer, answer your question? Okay, good. Um, the other thing I would recommend that you do um, is I would start by figuring out what the structure is you're trying to make. There's a few things on here that um, use non-standard nomenclature or that we didn't learn how to name. Um, for instance, norbornene. Norbornene is a bicyclic structure. We didn't talk about naming bicyclic structures. So you wanna go look at what this structure is, build your structure out, look it up on Molview, um, make sure that you get the right structure because remember the Molview doesn't always do the stereochemistry right, especially. Um, so that you know you're moving the right way. The other one that's really common that uh, uh, we didn't use is methylene. If you have a methylene group, that means you've got a ring structure with a, an alkene um, directly attached to it. So cyclopentane, methylene cyclopentane looks like that, where you've got an alkene sort of fused to a ring structure. Um, so make sure that you're finding the right structure here, double check that would be the best place to go and then start working backwards, start trying to see what you can do. And I would expect these to take you a little bit. I don't think, you know, if you're good at synthesis and you got lucky with the one I assigned you and you see the connection right away, you might be able to do it in an hour or so. Um, I would expect it to take significantly longer than that, which is why I'm assigning it now. And you've got until the last day of finals week to turn it in. Although I would recommend doing it before finals week starts, but that's your call. Any, any other questions? All right. I got a question. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see potassium permanganate on that list. Um, then there could be, it could be because there's a way around it. Um, for instance, potassium permanganate is a good, is a good oxidizing agent, right? Um, and so it could be that there's a different oxidizing agent on here, or I could have just missed it. But that is a common enough one that we probably want to put that one on, even if there's another option. So go ahead and assume that it's on there as well, and I'll add it and update the, um, the files here in, in a little bit. Appreciate it. No problem. Any other egregious mistakes here, oversights? Um, some of these are just going to be used as solvents too, like diethyl ether is not under the, pre under the precursors section because we don't use ethers as reactants that much. We more, we more frequently use ethers as a solvent. So there are a couple of things that might be, um, they could be in either section, really, like acetone, for instance. We don't use acetone as a 
or acetic acid. Um, but if it's on here, you can use it as a, as a carbon source, but the most common precursors are the ones you probably wanna start from what's on the left-hand side. You wouldn't wanna use diethyl ether as your starting material in most cases. All right, well, I will let you pour over this to see if there's anything else I've forgotten. Um, in the meantime, I'll open some breakout rooms if you want. You can log off and start working on it and pop back in if you want. I'll keep this room going until at least at least three um, or as long as people are in here working, um, whichever comes last. And I'm not gonna stay past four though, but um, I will be available by office hours and, and in la lecture and things like that. If, it's a, if you do have a, a general question, feel free to ask during lecture on Thursday or anytime. Um, and if it's something specific to your synthesis, then I might tell you to wait until break or come back in office hours if possible, um, or send me an email. All right, well, get after it. Hey, Sean, I have a question. Yeah. Um, well, actually, more, can I ask you what diendo means, uh, or is that my responsibility to look? So, like you endo, just learned endo kind of today and then endothermic, but I feel like I don't know how you could have diendo on the same four or five. So, diendo would mean that, that you have a substituent on four that is endo and a substituent on five that is also endo. Oh, okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, I was thinking double endo, I, but yeah, I see it now. You, you're right, you could not have diendo on the same carbon. It means that both carbons four and five have an endo substituent. Gotcha, thank you. No problem.